Hello there. The Labour Party needs a new leader. And not just because Jeremy Corbyn is standing down. No, the Labour Party needs a new leader for its own survival. Firstly, as ever, please kickstart that YouTube algorithm into action by giving this video a big fat like. So it's official. When it comes to the British voting public, Jeremy Corbyn is about as welcome as Donald Trump arriving at Greta Thunberg's birthday party with an 80-foot greetings card made out of plastic and decorated with singed baby koala hide. Because according to a snap YouGov poll, the outgoing Labour Party leader scored 0 out of 10 from 42% of the poll respondents. And as you can see from this graph, he didn't score very highly at all above the 0% line until we get to the don't knows, where 11% of them didn't know how to rate him. So one assumes that's because there were no negative numbers available. And this may be what led Angela Rayner, who is standing for deputy leader as running mate to Rebecca Long-Bailey, to reportedly demand that Long-Bailey, if elected, must get rid of Corbyn's two top advisers, Carrie Murphy and Seamus Milne. But making pronouncements like this at the start may sound great and get you the support of MPs and MEPs, but there is still a long way to go, as I'll explain in a moment which is something that another leadership contender, Keir Starmer, seems to have cottoned on to when he said he would stick with the radical agenda. But even that has its definite downside, as if he wins, he could find himself atop a Mustang with no reins, saddle or stirrups with which to control it. So let's start with a quick look at how the Labour Party leadership race is going to be decided. Firstly, to get on the list, a candidate has to be nominated by a minimum of 22 of their fellow MPs or MEPs. So far, as of 5pm last night, four out of the six who have said they will stand have passed that threshold. But they do have until Monday to get the required amount. So at present we have... Keir Starmer on 68 nominations. Rebecca Long-Bailey on 26. Lisa Nandy on 24, Jess Phillips on 22, Emily Thornbury on 10, and Clive Lewis on 4. And Clive Lewis doesn't seem to want to make friends in the House of Commons, with The Telegraph reporting, Hard left candidate Clive Lewis on Friday risked angering colleagues after claiming that his race may have played a part in his failure to attract more nominations from Labour MPs. Anyway, that's a total of 154 nominations out of the 212 MPs and MEPs available. So there are still 58 nominations going begging. Maybe they're waiting for a late entrant to show up. Could we see a Jeremy Hat in the ring again? Or even Tony Blair's? But not Barry Gardner as after putting his toe in the water, he found out very quickly that he would not get the required support. Now, one point here is that at this stage, if you are an MP or MEP, you can nominate yourself. Seems strange to me. Why not just make it 21 nominations and you can't nominate yourself? Anyway, only two of the candidates have not thus far nominated themselves, and those two are... Keir Starmer and Emily Thornbury. Anyway, it doesn't end there. They then have to get either 5% of the constituency Labour parties to nominate them, or to get three affiliate organisations to nominate them, two of which have to be trades unions. The ballot itself opens on the 21st of February and closes at noon on the 2nd of April, with a special conference being called on the 4th of April to announce the results. And it's calculated on a one-person, one-vote ballot with Civica as the independent scrutineer using a single-round preferential voting system. 
So if one candidate gets over 50% of the votes straight away, then they win. But if not, then the one with the fewest votes gets dropped and their votes get redistributed amongst the others based on the stated preference of the voter. And this keeps going on until one person gets over 50% of the vote. But the vote also shows not a little hypocrisy. Because if you are not a paid-up member, but you are a registered supporter and want to vote, then you have to pay a fee of £25. And here was me thinking that Labour believed that voting should be free. But only when the taxpayer can foot the bill, it seems. Further from reading the timetable, I see that as a registered supporter, the opening date for applications to vote is from 5pm on the 14th of January and it closes two days later at 5pm on the 16th of January. Seems odd, if I'm reading that right. Sounds like they aren't that keen on the vote going much wider than the trades unions and the momentum membership, doesn't it? And as an aside, the elections for the Labour Party deputy leadership post are being run in tandem under the same rules. And at present, this is the picture. Angela Rayner on 72 nominations. Ian Murray on 30. Richard Bergen on 18. Rosina Alin Khan on 17. And Dawn Butler on 15. But at the end of the day, it's not the nominations that win you the prize, it's the votes. So bear in mind that those voting are likely to be generally the same people that voted for Jeremy Corbyn to replace Ed Miliband back in 2015. In fact, since Corbyn became leader, he may well have attracted many more ardent socialists to the Labour cause, who will be voting in this leadership election. And given that Corbyn achieved a landslide victory of 59.5% in the first round, then it is not inconceivable that a continuity Corbyn candidate such as Rebecca Long-Bailey could find herself in the seat. But many in the party will recognise that maybe the people aren't as fond of socialism as they are, so they might want to choose someone who else who may be more acceptable to the voters. But there's no point doing that unless you're prepared to reinvent the party and row back to the middle ground of politics. And I'm not sure those holding the reins in Labour are quite ready to go down that path. But what I do detect is a public that is getting fed up to the back teeth of politicians, political parties and their supporters all telling us how awful we are and that we must keep our mouths shut unless we agree with them and that the UK is a terrible place to live. They are fed up with being told which words they're allowed to use today, which words they must say or be branded a non-progressive bigot and which ideas they must not let enter their heads or risk a knock on the door from the thought police. They're fed up with watching indoctrination taking place right under their noses in schools, universities and the media. And all this is piling in from the left, causing more damage every day to family, community and national cohesion. Which is exactly what hard left socialists want to see. But the public has now cottoned on and are getting more vociferous about it every day. Just look at the reaction to Ricky Gervais and his Golden Globes award speech. The UK public is waking up and realising they've been duped. Right now, the momentum-driven Jeremy Corbyn brand of Marxism is like an organ transplant. You need to take lots of medicine to prevent rejection. But the medicine the left uses of bullying, lies and insults might stave rejection off for a short while, but will always fail in the end. It's been a surreal few weeks since the general election, and to be frank, quite astonishing to see that people really were not buying into the hard left's bile. Not that you'd realise that at the time from the mainstream media. The whole thing is like that scene at the end in The Wizard of Oz, 
where the curtain is pulled back and instead of finding something impressive and powerful, all you get in Labour's case is a rather pathetic and frowny old man. And most importantly, there was no split nation. The general election tells that story. And it wasn't just about getting Brexit done, it was also a story of using the ballot box to reject the extreme. It was about rejecting the Labour Party vision of an extreme hard-left state where Marxists run every aspect of your life right down to what you're allowed to think. It encompassed the rejection of identity politics and its perverse mission to leave the people divided and dangling in a negative state of fear about whether they are doing, saying or thinking the wrong things. Labour lost because the British psyche has a natural aversion to extremism. And I would hazard a guess that the seeming support for Corbyn and the hard left amongst the young has more to do with their life experience and constant exposure to socialist thought in our education system. But that's not their fault. It's our fault for letting it happen. We've allowed a controlling system to develop and worse, given it the permission to tell us what to do, say and think. And even worse, we've given it the permission to control us through our offspring. They are used by the left as proxies to impart the correct message to us. And if we disagree then our competence as a parent can be easily called into question by the state, with heartbreaking results that the left care not one jot about. All they want is control. And it's very easy to wrest that control away from parents when they are both at work trying to earn the money to keep the wolf from the door. They should be able to trust the state, whose wages they pay, to educate their children without bias. But the education system is now riven with socialism, so sadly it will continue for many years. Which is why we must all get more engaged in politics, especially local politics, where a council can make or ruin a school. And you then end up with children who are told they are better and more knowledgeable than their parents that just following a prescribed route to having more certificates and diplomas is somehow proof of intellectual and moral superiority. With politicians who fate the youth as having all the answers, when in truth all politicians are doing is sowing the seeds of intense disappointment, mainly of the students in themselves, down the road. Modern education seems to be about trying to overturn what Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. The left wants you to stay as a child, or at least feel constrained and self-censored into childlike compliance. I wonder how many of our youth recognise that the impossibly high bars they set for their elders today will be exactly the same bars they fail to clear themselves tomorrow. Right now we need to bring some balance and common sense back into our lives. We need our freedom of thought back and our ability to openly express those thoughts and feelings and, yes, express our fears. Adults and those that wish to be treated as such should have no need for safe spaces to protect them from words. And every time we protect a minority interest from criticism, we just shut down more of our freedom of expression. But worse, it cuts down our ability to communicate with each other as humans, because every look or utterance could eventually be construed as potentially offensive, even blinking your eyes. This lefty-inspired political correctness would drive us apart. It can never bring us together. And that's what causes conflict. And I think most people get that. 
but have felt constrained by PC-inspired laws to hold their tongues and bottle up their concerns, which in turn leads to bottled up resentment and anger. And maybe the Labour Party got some of that backlash in the general election as well. The electorate sent a very loud message to the Labour Party on the 12th of December. A clear message that both the leadership people and its policies were wrong. And only by changing both the people and the policies while taking a lurch back onto the centre ground of politics do they stand a chance of ever forming a government again. But I get the distinct impression that those operating the inner party machinery are still shouting in their own little echo chamber. So I see Labour further distancing itself from ordinary people and suffering a further reduction in its influence as a result. Especially as there appears to be a real lack of true leadership material in the ranks of the candidates. Anyway, if you want to see more of me, you can buy a mug with my mug on it. And if you want to hear more from me, then please don't forget to subscribe and also press that little bell or you won't get any notifications. Anyway, what do you think about the Labour Party's chances of survival? Please share and comment and thank you for watching.